Welcome, welcome. Who's excited tonight? I know we are. Goodness gracious. Sonia Renee Taylor, she is in the house tonight with us, and you are here with us. It is an honor to host tonight where we're going to reflect on the role of radical self love for us and for all of humanity. We have an amazing author, educator, activist, artist with us to guide us in self-reflection and social change. Over 600 people signed up to join us tonight. You represent social work students, alumni, faculty, staff, but what's so amazing is nearly half of you are community members here in Denver, across Colorado, across the entire United States. And we are so delighted that you have chosen to spend this evening with us. We hope you've got a drink, a warm blanket, a dinner, a copy of Sonia's book, and you're ready to go. I'm Amanda Moore McBride. I'm Dean of the School of Social Work, and we love our Catalyst for Social Justice series. We bring folks just like Sonia to come and ignite us in the possibilities to create a more humane world. As we approach today's conversation, I encourage you to commit to change, to changing yourselves, your relationships with others, the communities that you live in, the organizations you work in. We at the School of Social Work are committed to social change and it's fueled by our commitment to right the wrongs, to act toward justice for the original peoples whose land the University of Denver stole. We act toward justice for those in our society who are marginalized, who have been killed, who are erased by white supremacy and patriarchy. Our series that and offering up these incredible change makers to inspire and guide us is just one small act that we hope gets us closer to justice. Leading today's conversation is Professor Aaron Harrop. I feel like they've been at GSSW for years, but uh, they're new to our faculty and have brought uh, an incredible dimension to our commitment around social and racial justice and their expertise around eating disorders, weight stigma, adolescent health behaviors, and patient provider communication. Um, it, fueled by a practice background, Professor Harrop brings uh, such a commitment to thinking about interventions and recognizing that social change starts with us as individuals. I'm so grateful for you, Erin, being here tonight, holding this space for us and leading us in discussion. Um, I say, let's go, let's do this. Thank you so much, Dean McBride. Um, I also wanted to extend my gratitude uh, to you and to the DU Graduate School of Social Work for hosting the Catalyst Series for Social Justice. I know that those of you who have been at the earlier uh, events this year know just how powerful and uplifting these events are, particularly in the midst of the pandemic, um, when we feel so much more isolated from our colleagues and our communities. Um, and knowing that so many community members are here tonight is just really wonderful. Um, I know that tonight will be no exception. Um, we are all in for a treat with author, poet, and activist Sonia Renee Taylor. Um, I had the privilege of hearing Sonia Renee Taylor speak and perform her poetry at my very first Body Liberation Conference in 2015 with the Association for Size, Diversity, and Health. Um, this was prior to Sonia's book coming out, um, though by that point she was already a celebrated poet and had published her collection of poems called A Little Bit of Truth on Your Shirt, if you haven't uh, read that. Um, at that point in time, I was a first year doc student and I had been doing substance use research for four years, but deep down I had really wanted to pursue my interest in weight stigma and eating disorders and broader body liberation work. Uh, but I was afraid that if I pursued this line of research, there would be no place for me in the academy, as few people were doing this work. But at the same time, I was also acutely aware of how problematic fat phobia and body oppression was in the world. I just didn't know how to take action to change it. Uh, so attending this conference was one of my very first ventures out into the body liberation world to see if pursuing that kind of research agenda could be possible. Uh, at that conference, Sonia spoke about how she about what she called the number one challenge facing the weight stigma community, 
And she called in our all white board um, that led our organization saying that, that the biggest challenge that was facing our community was our laser focus on weight and size discrimination when in reality, all oppression is bound up together. And she went on to say, as she argues in her book, that all oppression is of the body, all oppression is embodied. And she warned us that if we were to ignore what she called the threads of unity between our struggles, that the related struggles of people of color, of the LGBTQ community, of the poor and working class, of the disability community, if we were to ignore these interconnected experiences of impression, then our fight for body liberation would be faltering and incomplete. That conference ended up marking a turning point for our organization and a continued conversation about equity that continues to this day. I'm happy to report that this year, the organization welcomed the most diverse board of directors that the organization has ever seen. Sonia has a particular talent for showing her audiences how our greater advocacy work with our communities is intricately linked to our own personal experiences of privilege, oppression, and liberation. As you'll see today, she models this in her writing and her speaking. During that conference, I was deeply moved when Sonia shared a part of her own body story, the story of how she came to make the decision to shave her head in an intentional radical act to push back against the body rules about beauty and respectability in society. She shared about how that decision radicalized her and was a catalyst for all, um, of all, a catalyst of sorts for her journey into radical self-love and her stance now as a visible, powerful advocate for body liberation work. When I look back now, I see how that conference was a turning point for me as well. While I didn't shave my own head until seven years later, I did open up to the possibility of pursuing body liberation work in the academy. At the time I saw Sonia perform, I was too shy to ask her to pose in a picture with me, but I did ask her to sign my book, which she did right here. Uh, and she signed with the phrase, keep thinking radically, which is something that I've remained committed to. I ended up changing my dissertation direction later that year. I met a future committee member at that very same conference. And now having ha found a home, an academic home at the University of Denver, a part of me feels as if I've come full circle. To be here now as a faculty member doing body liberation work and welcoming Sonia Renee Taylor to speak to my beloved community about this topic of how radical self-love can catalyze social justice. Um, to those of you who are newer to the body liberation movement, I also wanna point out that within social work, most of our efforts for social justice as of yet do not include size discrimination as part of our explicit, explicit social work purview. Our larger social work community has not yet taken up the mantle for body liberation. Sizeism is considered an afterthought in social work practice, education, and research. I hope that through this keynote today, you will start to see that like Sonia, we all have a body story. From birth to death, we carry our bodies and their stories with us. Our bodies are, I would argue, our most constant and faithful companions. How we treat our bodies, how we speak to them, nourish, move, cause them harm, relate to our bodies and the oppressions and privileges that they face. How we do that literally is an embodiment of how we are in the world. So I hope that today, as you listen to Sonia Renee Taylor, that you will understand anew how all of our oppression is embodied and bound up together and how social justice movements that leave certain bodies behind whether they be black and brown bodies, poor, undocumented, disabled, neuroatypical, or fat, that these bodies that are left behind are an indictment to our movements and a challenge for us to be more inclusive in our work going forward. So with that, I'm going to wish you all a very happy Black History Month and a happy Eating Disorders Awareness Week. This is the perfect time for this talk. And it is my privilege to introduce our speaker. Sonia Renee Taylor is the founder and radical executive officer of The Body Is Not An Apology, an international movement and organization committed to radical self-love and body empowerment as the foundational tool for social justice and global transformation. She is the author of The Body Is Not An Apology, The Power of Radical Self-Love. Sonia's work as an award-winning performance poet, activist, and transformational leader continues to have global reach. Sonia is a former, former national and international poetry slam champion, 
author, educator, and activist who has mesmerized audiences across the US, New Zealand, Australia, Germany, England, Scotland, Sweden, Canada, and the Netherlands, as well as in prisons, mental health treatment facilities, homeless shelters, universities, festivals, and public schools across the globe. Uh, so with that, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Sonia Renee Taylor. Hello, hi everyone. What, uh, can you, can everyone hear me first and foremost? Uh, yay, awesome. And feel free, humans in the chat, please, please, please talk to me in the chat. You are my connection and energy um, in this space today. So, you know, please engage that. Um, Aaron, I just want to thank you. So the other thing I'm going to ask, I know that like, it's just supposed to be my face. I love actually being able to see faces. It helps me feel like I'm not talking to the abyss. So if you want to be, I love, <laughs> you better slide in, <laughs> Dean, Dean McBride. <laughs> I live for that. Thank you so much. That's perfect. Um, Eric, thank you for that exception. Like uh, throw my bio out the window. I just want you to just like say that thing everywhere I go. <laughs> It was incredible. Thank you so much. And I was sitting here completely like, how do, how do they have a new copy of the body is, of, of a little truth on my shirt? No one has that book. <laughs> I love it so much. And I love how full circle um, this experience gets to be. And that, you know, we just, we just get to keep reconnecting with each other and deepening our understanding and expanding possibility together. And that like, you know, Octavia Butler says, everything you touch, you change and everything you change changes you. The only constant is change. God is change. And I'm so present to that right now um, that like we've had opportunities to touch each other's lives and everyone has been changed as a result. And what a gift that is, right? Like what a tremendous, tremendous gift. So I just wanna thank you University of Denver for having me. I'm talking to you all from the future. I am in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, sitting in my bedroom, which you, you know, if not for technology, this would not be possible, uh, but it is, what's today? It is Thursday, February 24th at 2.16 p.m. for me. Uh, and so it turns out to be a beautiful day in the future. So go on ahead and make it there. It'll be good. <laughs> I want to say that. Um, a couple of sort of um, uh, accessibility notices that I want to share with you. I am currently navigating Omicron. Um, I tested positive yesterday and so um, it's a very mild case. I'm feeling very grateful it is a mild case. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I do have some fatigue. So, you know, just know that. Know that if I apologize if my energy is not, you know, as high as it might normally be. But again, all of you and your beautiful energy, I'm certain, is sending me, feeding me with good energetic vibes. And so thank you um, for that in advance. Uh, yeah. Oh, and with that, the thing that came up for me as I thought about that earlier today was like, hire disabled people. Let me just say that again, hire disabled people. Like if I can sit here in my throne, it is my throne, I love this chair. <laughs> but if I can sit here in my bedroom, in my bed of infirm and share with you all, there's no reason why we are not actively hiring disabled people and using the technology we have to be educated and inspired and given deeper wisdom and understanding from people who are, have the lived experience of what it means to navigate these times. We would be, we are cheating ourselves out of an opportunity by not listening to the wisdom of disabled people in this period of time. Stop, let's stop doing that. Any place where you have influence and the opportunity to be, to be raising the voices of disabled people, to be raising the voices of the disability justice movement, that is a thing we absolutely, absolutely need to be doing right now. Thank you. Uh, and so with that, um, like I said, I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful to be in this conversation with you all today. Um, and I, you know, I want to talk about I want to talk about my journey to this point because I feel like the story inside of it is such a, you know, is my answer to like, how is radical self-love 
you know, social justice work? How is it transformative activism? How do we change the world through this work? And I'm very clear that, um, you know, in, in many ways, I've said this before, like radical self-love is like a, a photo, right? A photo that someone presented to me. And I was like, I feel so inspired and overcome every time I look at this photo, I have to find a place to put it so that I see it every day. And so I stuck it to the refrigerator known as the world. <laughs> you all are my refrigerator. <laughs> and on my refrigerator is radical self-love, the image, so that I remember to look at it every day. So that I remember that this is actually, I love y'all, it's not actually about you. <laughs> it's about me and my own journey. And because we are tied up together, because interconnectedness is the actual um, circumstance of our being, there is no way for me to be transformed without it also transforming others. And there's no way for others to be transformed without it actually transforming me, right? There's a, there is a, a reason why I signed a book like Stay Radical to Aaron seven, eight years ago before I ever had a book deal for a book called The Body Is Not an Apology, The Power of Radical Self-Love. And there was already an understanding that there was something I needed to know and I needed to say out loud and I needed to say out loud because somebody else needed to know something in that for their own journey, right? And I never want us to miss the interconnectedness of that. I saw a meme the other day that said, it was like, there are certain, it, it like auto played this vibrate, this sound, it sounded like a chime. And it was like, there are certain frequencies that when played are, can be detected in like vibrating off of like the furthest stars in the furthest most, uh, you know, galaxies of our, of our solar system. And how dare it is that we would ever think that we are not all connected, right? That there is any such thing as the other. Right. If if you can make a sound that the stars, you know, 110 million light years away can feel, then we might actually all be impacting each other. Right. <laughs> that might be a thing that's happening. Um, and for me, what a that's a beautiful reflection. It's a beautiful reflection to know that we might all be impacting each other because then it gets to make us choiceful. It gets to make us intentional. What if I know that I have no choice but to impact you, then the question becomes, how do I wanna do that? What do I wanna do with that kind of power that we all hold with one another, right? Um, so for those who don't know me, um, and you, you know, I imagine some of y'all might've just stumbled in because you have nothing else to do on a Wednesday night. In such case, <laughs> um, I'm Sonia Renee Taylor and I'm the founder and radical executive officer of The Body Is Not An Apology, which is a digital media and education company exploring the intersection of um, body and identity and social justice using uh, the framework of radical self-love. And um, I did, all of this, like all of this is accidental. My whole life is one big, awesome, beautiful, cosmic accident. I didn't intend to start anything. I didn't know. <laughs> I just happened to be out here minding my business and life was like, now this. Um, and so, you know, the initial part of minding my business was like, I was just being a poet, writing poems. You know, I spent a lot of time in uh, Colorado because um, I have a, a beloved uh, former partner um, who lived out that way. And so I hung out a lot, me and me in Colorado, me and Denver, me and uh, Boulder. We spent a lot of time together. Uh, <laughs> and um, during those times, I was just a poet. I was just out in these streets writing and performing poetry. And even that was accidental because before I was doing that, I was out here doing HIV prevention and education with street-based sex workers in Washington, DC. And you know, before that I was living you know, in a, a wilderness facility in Florida um, doing work with, doing you know, um, work with kids with emotional behavioral challenges you know, in, in the wilderness, like before, you know, I've, I've been doing a lot of different things over my life. And one thing that has been true is that when, when life presents me with something, um, 
the only consistent truth about that is I listen. And don't mistake that for I'm not hard-headed because I'm hard-headed <laughs> and I'm willful. But, you know, but at the end of the day, I listen. And what I listen to is the thing resonating inside of me that is the yes, right? And the, and the yes is always moving us toward greater alignment with one, our own divine purpose in this world and the divine purpose of the collective. And I absolutely, with my whole being, believe the divine purpose of the collective is such that we might all be able to access, exercise and access the richest, most verdant, most powerful manifestation of our own love in these vessels on this planet. All of us. That is, that is what I believe the planet desires to see is to see beauty and power and love come from all of us and then to see what does that make, right? And, and beauty and power and love are, are complex. They are not simple things. And I think one of the greatest challenges, one of the greatest disservices that we have done to ourselves is to minimize the power of love to make it sappy and superfluous, to make it uh, benign and little and, you know, commercialized and capitalistic and, you know, to be, you know, some sort of saccharine offering that doesn't have inside of it massive transformational power, massive transformative energy that can create and destroy an equal capacity. And I'm very clear that, that that love is where that yes comes from, right? That there is something, there is something calling me to that. And I'm clear that I'm not the only one. If I was the only one, then none of y'all would be here. I'd be here talking to myself, <laughs> right? But that, that yes, guided by what I believe is radical self-love is calling you to. It's in each and every one of us calling us to create something in our own lives that is a reflection of it, to make it manifest in material form in our own existence. And that that can be, that can, you know, you can make a sandwich with transformative love. I just want to tell you that today. You can make a sandwich today with transformative love. I have a friend who's staying with me and she made me a bowl of chicken noodle soup because I'm in here in the struggle. And, you know, I, I want to share, right? Because I'm also real human and real judgy. And I was like, I don't like when my vegetables are cut up big. <laughs> so I be my most ungrateful, awful self. And I ate the soup in what I felt was so much love and care, so much nourishing. I was like, this soup was made with transformative love, right? With the love that desires me to be healed and whole, right? We have the ability to offer that to each other. And so I think, you know, if you've read the book, The Body is Not an Apology, um, I talk about in the beginning of the book, the start, the start of this journey, which started with a conversation with a friend in a hotel room at a poetry slam. And inside of that conversation, uh, you know, my friend shared with me that she might have an unintended pregnancy. Um, and, you know, she had a casual partner. You know, and I'm a nosy friend. I'm I am I'm learning to be um a more intentionally nosy friend. I'm not now I, I ask for permission before I get in your business. Usually I used to just get in your business, but now I ask permission first. <laughs> and but once I you give me your permission, I'm gonna get in your business. So from that, I asked this friend about her sexual health choices. And I asked this, I like to say that there were three things present in this conversation that made it possible. And I'm gonna add a fourth right now. Or actually, I'm not gonna add the fourth. The three things make the fourth. There was radical empathy, there was radical honesty, and there was radical vulnerability. My friend um, was sharing with me about this unintended preg pregnancy. And I asked a radically honest question. I asked her, why she was having unprotected sex with the casual partner she wasn't that into. And I didn't ask from a place of judgment. I didn't ask with any kind of shame or you should be doing something else. I asked out of genuine curiosity 
about what it was that moved her through her decision making. And I asked because I too had made decisions where I was like, oh, well, I, these decisions have landed me in a place I didn't necessarily want to be in. I should probably get curious about why, why I'm moving that way. And so I asked her with that in it. And she responded to me with radical vulnerability. And she said to me, Sonia, my disability, she had cerebral palsy. She said, my disability makes it difficult to be sexual with positioning and stuff. And it just felt like an extra thing. And I just really, did, I didn't feel entitled to ask this person to use a condom. And I responded from, I didn't respond. I felt a radical empathy. And my opening to that radical empathy, like that, that, oh, I understand that place. That radical empathy opened something in me that allowed me to be a channel. And that's the more important thing. What I said next didn't come from me. It just came through me. And it came through me because it was for both of us. It wasn't just for her. It was for us. And what came through me was your body is not an apology. It is not something you offer to someone to say sorry for my disability. And when I said it, I was clear that something was talking to us and it just was happening to use me as the puppet du jour, but something was talking to us. And those three ingredients were what, became, what made possible that channeling of transformative love, right? Those three ingredients, radical empathy, radical honesty, and radical vulnerability made the cake called transformative love. And that transformative love was so big, so pulsating, wanted so much to see itself manifest in the world that it was like, and now here's what you are to do next, Sonia. And it didn't, it, you know, these steps came incrementally. So the next step was, you should probably write that as a poem. That sounds awfully poetic, girl. <laughs> and so, and so I was like, I guess I'm going to write this poem. The body is not an apology, which I will do for you all before. Um, was it, did you all ask for it? If so, I'll do it at the end when we're all done. Um, and so I wrote this poem. And I, I started performing and sharing this poem. And language makes the world possible. And this is why it's so important what we say. What you say is important. What we speak over our own lives and over the lives of each other is important. It's the reason why, you know, it, you know, when people are like, oh, they're being, you know, sensitive, the snowflakes, the blah, 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 you know, whatever it is that we're when people want to use language to evade responsibility. You know, they have all kinds of names that they'll call you. But what they're failing to acknowledge is the power of language, right? The power of language to impact and influence how it is that we understand ourselves and how it is we get to move through the world. I just read um, the decree that Governor Greg Abbott in Texas signed um, demanding that uh, parents of trans children be uh, investigated for child abuse, right? That is, that is the destructive power of language, right? That with, with word and power, you have the ability to dismantle entire lives. You have the ability to thwart the um, autonomy and self-actualization of young people, right? You have the ability to you have the ability to make, as a doctor, to make a fat person never decide to go to a doctor again, right? You have the ability to, as a parent, instill decades of shame in your child that they will spend 50, 60, $70,000 with the therapist trying to figure out how to undo, right? That is the power of language. And so the question becomes, what will we do with that? How do we raise it to consciousness such that we are intentional about how we wield it? And so when I wrote the poem, the body is not an apology, or when the poem wrote itself through me, which is probably the better way to say that, um, it, it was clear that there was an agenda for this language because this language was like there is something that needs to be created in the world. 
right? And Sonia, you got picked today. So it's just you. But what I want you to understand is I'm not special. I'm not special. There is, there is some energy of transformative love that is tapping you on the shoulder today and picking you to do your part in making it manifest in the world. I'd like to believe that that is why people decide to become social workers. I recognize that that isn't always the truth. I recognize that isn't always the history of the field, right? I recognize that, but I'd, but I'd like to believe that, at, that the, um, un, the unwarped truth, right, of our movement in that direction is about that calling toward making a love manifest in the world, right? A love that looks like care, a love that looks like protection, a love that looks like equity and justice, a love that looks like an honoring of all bodies, a love that looks like opportunity for people who have been historically, you know, uh, marginalized and kept from opportunity. Ultimately, I believe that inside of us is something that is calling us to do our part to make love manifest in the world. And this poem was my part in that moment. And that poem kept unfolding itself. It was like, great, I'm a poem. Now go say this poem because there's something in it for this person's journey. There's something in it for that person's journey. There's something in it for that person's journey. And there's something in it for your journey, Sonia, right? It, it wants something from you. And the more you say it, the more it's going to start revealing to you what it wants from you. And you know, the small and tiny way, and I talk about this in the book, is there was a selfie, you know, a selfie of me and a black horsey getting ready for a show, feeling fabulous and feeling like I didn't have a right to feel fabulous. Feeling like there was a world that said, you have a fat, black, dark, queer, neurodivergent body. And thusly, there is no reason why you should feel like you should celebrate, right? There is no reason why you should feel like you are, are worthy of celebration in that body. And so I hid, my, I hid the picture away, but this energy of transformative love was always there countering that. It was like, I don't care what they told you you should believe. Right? I don't care what the world says about that body. The first thing you felt was me. The first thing you felt was, oh, wow, go ahead, girl. I'm giving it to the people. That's the first thing I felt when I saw the picture. <laughs> and then all of the other stuff came rushing in afterwards that how dare you? How dare you value that body? How dare you not be ashamed of that body? How dare you not malign that body? That all came in second. Right. And because this this word in the form of poem had been out in the world and it had been using me to share it, it also was in me now. And so it started being louder or at least as loud as that other voice, as that voice that was like, you don't have any business celebrating you. You don't have any business appreciating you. This other voice was like, is that true? Do you have to believe that? What would happen if you didn't? And it was just loud enough to make me take one next step, to say one next yes in the moment. And the yes was to posting the picture. Sure, I'm going to post this picture. Fine, I'm gonna let, fine. Maybe I don't have to listen to that voice telling me I'm not enough, telling me I'm too fat and too black, and too ugly, and too dark. Maybe I don't have to listen to that. Maybe I'll just post this picture. And so I posted the picture. And, you know, because I'm sure in a former life I was a cult leader, <laughs> I'm certain of it. <laughs> so now everything I do, I'm like, wanna do it with me? Uh, <laughs> And so I asked other people <laughs> to post pictures where they felt powerful in their bodies. And 30 people tagged me in photos. And obviously it wasn't just a yes for me, right? It wasn't just a yes for me. There was an, a, what 
I was being assigned to do was to extend that experience of transformational love beyond myself because there is no such thing on the most massive level there's no such thing as just the self right and if we understood that when we understand that when we deeply deeply embody that there is no such thing as just the self then of course we make room for every body in the world right of course all of a sudden the fat body is not a body to be maligned because the fat body is not the other body. There is no other body, right? And because we are actually only just mirrors for one another, right? We are just out here seeing ourselves reflected in the person standing in front of us. Every time we obstruct the flow of transformational love for somebody else, we, we obstruct it for ourselves. Every time we are in the way of someone else's most expansive, most powerful manifestation of love in their own beingness, we are cutting off access to ourselves. And so I tell people all the time, this is not an altruistic practice. I'm not saying go be good and nice and kind to all the bodies because it will make you a good person. It's not about being a good person. It's about being the whole you. It's about stop interrupting your most magnificent life by treating yourself as if, in, as if you are in some sort of competition with other people's bodies, because that is a false construct. That's a construct given to you by systems of white supremacist delusion and patriarchy and capitalism and ableism and fat phobia and homophobia and transphobia. These systems that we have built to figure out how to externally quantify that which is inherently existent. And if we understood it as inherently existent, we wouldn't need to externally quantify it. We wouldn't keep looking for ways to say, oh, this is what makes me enough now. Oh, this is what's gonna make me enough now. Oh, this is how I know I'm finally good enough. We don't need some external manifestation of our worthiness, of our divinity. It is inherent. And every time we try to make an external manifestation of what is an ever existing uninterruptible reality, right? We actually leave reality and then we go create illusion. And inside illusion, we create harm. Inside of that desire to create some external measure of enoughness, we reaffirm illusion and we create harm because the only reality is interconnectedness and love. That's actually what's true, right? And so the invitation has always been, how do I divest from that illusion and come back to truth? Right? And then how do I practice truth, which is love, as a regular everyday act in my own body and with the bodies of others? Right? And the only way to do that is to actually begin to see the distinction between that truth and the illusion, to be able to name it to put some distance between it, right? I believe that the poem, The Body Is Not an Apology was given to me in part was so that I had the practice of saying every day truth so that when non-truth was spoken, I could actually discern it, right? I mean, I think it's one of the most challenging dynamics of living in a misinformation, disinformation age is that all ever there's so much constant input that it becomes really difficult to tell what is true right but what is true is always going to be at source right it's always going to it's what's true is looking for ways to talk louder than the other stuff 
But if you listen to the other stuff more often, if you're listening to the outside more often, if your attention is on the outside more often, if you don't have any practice with what it means to just have to sit with yourself, right? And this is a thing that I think is so truthful for people in, in the helping professions, right? Sometimes some of us are helping so we don't have to deal with us. I'm sorry, I feel like I just stepped on somebody's toes intergalactically. I felt it in the ether. I was like, sorry. <laughs> I felt it. I was just, I was like, oh, I feel that. I'm sorry. And, and it's the truth, right? And what it does is it keeps you an illusion and it keeps you away from your own reality, which is love. Right. Because if you are, if your goal is to be out there doing something out there, because in here is a place that you do not believe is enough. Right. Then you're always still going to miss it. You know, it becomes what it does is it creates this endless pit you can't get out of. Right. Because you because you can't help enough. You can't do, you can't help enough to make yourself worthy, right? You can't help enough to, to fill that pit. There isn't an enough there, right? Because that's an illusion, right? But if you start with, that, with the enough that is already present, then everything else you give is from that beautiful, vibrant overflow that is you. And what we want to do is give from our overflow, right? I don't, I don't want your backwash. <laughs> the people that you want to help are not served by the dribbles and sediment and sludge at the bottom of your cup. They are served by being full, by being offered what is full and brimming and vibrant, right? What is overflow? That is what is restorative and replenishing to people, you know? And so the work is always to start here, right? And when we start here, everything else, everything else can't help but be impacted because there is no other, right? It just doesn't exist. And so, you know, one of the ways that I, I, I try to, you know, operationalize this, and I saw someone put it in the um, chat, right, is I, I talk about this bot, ladder of bodily hierarchy, right? And, what, and, and again, part of what I'm trying to do, and this is a, a phase that I'm in right now, right, where I started off talking about the body, and I talk about the body because it is, as far as I'm concerned, it's the great equalizer in the sense that we all got one. If you want to do this life, you got to do it in this flesh thing um my ex used to call it a um fleshy thought tube <laughs> you got to do it in the fleshy thought tube <laughs> um you have to do it in this in this corporal right this corporal entity and we have collectively as a society um impacted by these systems and structures made bodies mean something right it, Again, externalized value, externalized worth, externalized resource, externalized opportunity, externalized um, joy and peace and happiness, and who gets access to it and who doesn't, by these bodies, right? And we've decided there are some good bodies, and then there are lesser bodies. And that, that we've arranged that on a ladder of hierarchy, you know, and particularly Western societies have said, you know, that there is an ideal body, and that ideal body um, you can identify the ideal body by which bodies get the most in society, which bodies are treated the best in society, which bodies get the most access in society, right? That's, that's the body. And then you can, uh, you can look at your own body and figure out where you might land on that ladder of bodily hierarchy, right? But the ladder, while its impacts are real, while its experience on our lived um, journeys are real, the latter is an illusion. The latter is made 
up, completely made up, totally fictitious, doesn't mean anything. Only except so much as we are really invested in continuing to organize around it and understand ourselves based off of it and determine our worth inside of that structure. And part of the challenge of my work right now is I recognize it as an illusion, all right? And so it's hard for me to, sometimes, you know, it's even hard for me to even still talk about the body in the way that I used to talk about the body because I'm like, y'all, it's made up. It's, you just got a body and we all just got bodies, right? And I would much rather deal with the structures that we've created around these bodies and dismantle those and actually deal with the spiritual truth underneath it all, which is there is no other, right? I'm going to tell you the most uncomfortable thing I can say today. I am Greg Abbott. He is not my other. He is a manifestation of the part of me that still holds some value in that ladder. That's what he is. He's a projection of it. He is a projection of our collective investment in that ladder. Because guess what? If everybody changed, if everybody divested from that ladder, except for Greg Abbott, he would look up and he'd be like, damn, I've been tripping. <laughs> he wouldn't have anything to reflect back at him some sort of belief. It would become an illusion because you can only hold an illusion together when two people agree on it. That's the only way it can start looking like truth. But as soon as we collectively divest, the more of us divest, the more of us come to this larger understanding, then actually the, the holdouts don't have anything to look at where they see something that looks real anymore. And then they're left to ask themselves questions, the hard questions that we all have tried to avoid about ourselves. What is really true? Who am I really? What, what makes me, how do, how do I know I'm enough, right? Those are the questions that remain when those other things fall away. And there's an invitation for those other things to fall away. And so, you know, what I wanna leave you with, what I feel like I want you to most understand as we talk about how does this work of radical self-love lead to a changed world, right? It's because it leads to changed beings and beings are the world. That you are the world, that the world looks like you and what you believe about yourself. And that each and every one of us, as we transform that, right? As we transform that, we collectively weave together the possibility for a new kind of world, right? And that, that ev that never means, like I said, the impacts and outcomes of these systems and structures are very real, right? The person who hasn't gone to the doctor in 30 years because their experience was so violently fat phobic, that outcome is real, is a real outcome, right? But the invitation inside of that is always, how do I not believe the illusion that that doctor in that moment gave me? How do I divest from that illusion? And where can I find the reflection that is accurate? The reflection that is rooted in reality, the reflection that is rooted in transformative love. How do I not assume that it doesn't exist because this awful experience happened? How do I return to the reality by looking for transformative love? Because that is my reflection. That's my real reflection. And it is out there. I know it's out there because I stuck it on a refrigerator called y'all and I see it every day. And so I know that it is out there. I know you all are out there. And that's why I still get to do this work because I know I'm not alone in creating a world where what we see on the outside is a greater, more powerful reflection of the truth, which is love. Um, yeah, I just wanna thank you all so much. I want to leave some space for a Q and A. Um, yeah, thank you. Mm, warm and fuzzy, even in my uh, bed of infirm. <laughs> thank you. 
Um, how do we want to handle the, I was gonna say, how do we want to handle the Q&A? Sonia, um, I, I wanted to start just by kind of combining some of the questions that have been asked um, on our board. And um, I'm wondering, so you're talking about divesting from this, this illusion of hierarchy of bodies. And I'm wondering, what are some of the kind of more concrete ways that divestment looks like uh, for Absolutely. people that are just starting that journey? Totally. So again, like I said, it's about making the distinction between truth and illusion, right? And so part of that is, where are the places where my value is still externalized? What, let me take an inventory of my existence. Where am I still deciding if I do well enough in this class, then I'm good enough, <laughs> right? Where have I decided, oh, if, you know, if I get this degree, then I'm good enough. If I've served enough people, then I'm good enough. Where, where are those places, right? And so those are the like sort of immediate, but you can make it much bigger. Where, you know, is the, like, when I get down to this size, then I'm good enough, right? Oh, if, if I, um, you know, if I, if I, if I, eat clean this week, whatever weird language that is, then I'm good enough, right? We, we have all of these ways which we have externally, um, you know, externally structured our enoughness. And the first step is to raise that to consciousness. Wherever, and what would happen if once that's raised to consciousness and I say that is, makes me enough, what would happen if I decided that that wasn't true? And how would that move my next action? Just the next one, right? Sometimes this work is hard to do because we get way, 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 way far ahead of ourselves. And it's like, right, how do I dismantle the whole thing tomorrow? You're probably not gonna do that, boo. So stop trying. <laughs> but what you can say is, here's this one way today that I notice that I've externalized my worth and my value. And normally because I've externalized that, it would make me do this, right? It would make me forego my sleep or forgive my own wellness so that I can cram or do what, you know, like whatever it is, it would make me do something that doesn't involve centering myself and my own well being. And what would happen if this time I didn't do that and I took an opposite action and just and practice it? You're gonna be uncomfortable. It's gonna feel icky. You're gonna be like, I'm gonna fail. It's gonna be awful. And I can't promise you ain't gonna fail the test. Let me say that. I can't promise that. <laughs> what I can promise is, it will direct you to a different way to care for yourself and take care of your responsibility. That's what it will do. It will change how you orient to it such that, such that you don't become the sacrifice you make for some external value. Yeah. And I think I'll just do one more so that we have time for your poem at the end. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, but I'm going to kind of combine two more again. Uh, so uh, mainstream culture promotes this idea of kind of cutting out toxic peoples out of our lives. And um, the writer of this was finding this a bit troubling. Um, and I also want to bring in a trauma lens as well, that we also talk about people coming from a place of trauma or having been hurt and injured. And so I think part of what we're wondering is how can transformational love heal some of that personal or collective trauma, or how could a lens of interconnectedness and love, like you're talking about, maybe provide a different path for engaging with those who have caused us harm? Absolutely. So I want to share two things. One thing is a thing that I thought of the other day, but it came from a quote from my friend and brilliant, 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 brilliant um, thinker, embodiment activist, Prentice Hemphill said, boundaries are the distance at which I can love you and myself at the same time. And I found it to be such a wildly necessary recalibration of my understanding of like, how do we hold multiple things at once, right? And so, <laughs> What that made me think about is what I've been playing with in this idea is what's the distinction between boundaries and barriers, right? And barriers are designed to keep you out. Boundaries are designed to keep me well. Those are different, right? And I don't, and I don't have to, if we assume I have to keep you out to keep me well, first, one of the things that does is it makes, it positions all of your power in the other right? 
You've immediately given away your power. It's what you do that determines whether I'm well, right? And so the offering is, if I come back and I say, what, what is the boundary at which I can, again, love, right? I can love you and love me. Uh, the whole idea of like cutting you out is like just the language, right? The language is about separation. The language is about removal. The language is about some other. And love, one, because it transcends distance, I cannot have you in my daily life because that is a practice of wellness for me, for me. And that never, ever, ever has to interrupt the love that I hold for you, right? Um, but also it's for me, the, the most important thing has been, can I understand what you bring up in me? Because sometimes it's, uh, it ain't even about the other person. It's about me. And it's about what's the disavowed thing, the, the denied thing that I'm not, that I don't want to look at. And when I look at you, I got to look at it, right? I could, it, you know, it's the part where I just said, oh, like if Greg Abbott is me, right? Then cutting, first of all, cutting out Greg Abbott doesn't save the millions of people who are going to be impacted by the way in which Greg Abbott moves through the world, right? It doesn't actually, it doesn't actually honor the piece that is about interdependence, right? Which means that like, I have to care. I choose to care about what happens to other people. And if I just decide you're somebody else's problem now, then I've left that to them, right? As opposed to saying, how do I both care for me? Because to care for me is to care for everyone else. And also to also hold the humanity of this person who got made the same way we all got made. And they're a reflection of something that, that I need to explore in myself. And generally what happens is when we do that exploration, that person becomes a lot less triggering. That person stops being a person who, you know, I have to put, you know, that I need to cut off. Again, you may still need to have boundaries with that person, but cut them off becomes something that isn't true so much anymore because the thing it is that they elicited in you, you've actually tended to. Yeah, that's that's been my experience. Well, Sonia, I wanna be uh, sensitive to your time while also hearing your poem. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to turn the mic back over to you um, and yeah, looking forward to it. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, I haven't done this poem in ages, y'all. So let's just hope y'all send me good memory uh, vibes so that I don't lose the lines, but I think I have it. So um, this poem is sort of where it all started. It was a you know conversation with a friend that became a poem, that became a face page, Facebook page that became a movement and a book and a transformative way of living my life. Um, it's called The Body is Not an Apology. The body is not an apology. Let it not be forget me not fixed to mattress when night threatens to leave the room empty as the belly of a crow. The body is not an apology. Do not present it as a disassembled rifle when they have yet to prove themselves more than common intruder. The body is not an apology. Wait a minute. <laughs> I am going to read this poem as to not butcher it for you all. <laughs> Uh, I forgot, I was like, wow, boy. Oh, great, someone has it. Someone has written it on the internet, so it's easy to look at. <laughs> I'm going to start this again. The body is not an apology. Let it not be forget me not fixed to mattress when night threatens to leave the room empty as the belly of a crow. The body is not an apology. 
presented not as a disassembled rifle when they have yet to prove themselves more than common intruder. The body is not an apology. Let it not be common as oil, ash, or toilet. Let it not be small as gravel, stain, or teeth. Let it not be mountain when it is sand. Let it not be ocean when it is grass. Let it not be shaken, flattened, or raised in contrition. The body is not an apology. Do not give it as confession, communion. Do not ask for it to be pardoned as criminal. The body is not a crime, is not a gun, is not a spill to be contained, is not a lost set of keys, a wrong number dialed. It is not the orange burst of blood to shame white dresses. The body is not an apology. It is not the unintended granule of bone beneath will. The body is not kill, is not unkempt car, is not a forgotten appointment, do not speak it vulgar. The body is not soil, is not filth to be forgiven. The body is not an apology. It is not mother's dinner late again, wrecked jaw howl. It is not the drunken sorcery of contorting steel round tree. The body is not calamity. The body is not a math test. The body is not a wrong answer. The body is not a failed class. You are not failing. The body is not a hole to be filled, to be yanked out. It's not a broken thing to be mended, be tossed. The body is not prison to be served, is not sentence. Is not prison, is not sentence to be served, is not pavement, is not prayer. Do not give the body as gift, only receive it as such. The body is not to be prayed for, is to be prayed to. So for the evermore tortile 10th grade knows, hallelujah. For the shower song throat that crackles like a grandfather's Victrola, hallelujah. For the spine that never healed, for the broken heart that didn't either, hallelujah. For the sloping pulp of back, hip, belly, hosanna for the wild hairs that rove the face like a pack of misplaced wolves, hosanna for the parts we have endeavored to excise. Blessed be the cancer, the palsy, the wound that opens like a trap door. Praise the body in its blackjack magic. Even in this, for the razor wire mouth, for the sweet God ribbon within praise, for the mistake that never was, praise for the mistake you never were, praise for the bend, twist, fall and rise again, fall and rise again, for the raising like an obstinate Christ, for the salvation of a body that bends like a baptismal bowl, for those who will worship at the lip of this sanctuary, praise the body, for the body is not an apology. The body is deity. The body is God. The body is God. The only righteous love who will never need repent. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It's been a, a joy and a delight um, and a healing balm to get a chance to be with you all today. Thank you so much, Sonia. And I hope that you are watching the chat and just soaking in um, everyone's energy <laughs> and gratitude and peace tonight. Um, so uh, we have an upcoming event. Um, so coming up, our next speaker event will be in the GSSW Catalyst Series for Social Justice as we welcome Robin Wall Kimmerer on Tuesday, April 19th from 12 to 1 p.m. Uh, Mountain Standard Time. Robin is the author of Braiding Sweetgrass, an inspiring collection of essays about the natural world that weaves together indigenous wisdom, plant science, and personal narrative, inviting readers to revitalize their connection with the natural world. Information will be forthcoming, so please check GSSW's website for more information. And Sonia, I'm going to just uh, read back to you uh, just one stanza of one of your poems, um, because I believe it just uh, summarizes so much um, what you've given us here tonight. Um, so if you are a poet, a ridiculous broke ass poet, conjure up a word you believe will change this earth, then write it. But know whatever you do or create, regardless of how much money you make, the greatest gift you will ever receive is letting the universe teach you how to be delighted. Yay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Please, um, if you want to follow me, hang out with me, do other things with me, I'm on Patreon at Sonia Renee Taylor. Please hang out with me there. We're, you, we're actually starting a monthly Q&A so you can take some of these questions I didn't get to and hopefully ask them over there. You can also um, 
see what I'm up to occasionally on Instagram at Sonia Renee Taylor and the website is Sonia Renee Taylor. Thanks everyone. That poem was called Delighted. I'm just seeing the, the question in the chat. 